We saw that phenomenal retail sales number yesterday. It made me think, you got to own the rails. All aboard. This whole industry is a perfect proxy for commerce. And with commerce coming back, you have to believe the cargoes will come back, too. Take Union Pacific, currently my favorite railroad. In late April, this company reported a surprisingly resilient quarter, part because the precision railroading initiatives have allowed them to cut costs. Costs dramatically. When we realized that the world wasn't ending, the stock started roaring. In fact, it came within spinning distance of its all-time high earlier this month. But then we got some not-so-hot rail traffic data last week, and COVID cases started spiking again in the Sun Belt. New York Pacific's now down about 16 points from its recent highs. So could this be a buying opportunity of this great railroad, maybe the best way to invest in the return of American commerce? Let's take a closer look with Lance Fritz. He's the chairman, president, and CEO of Union Pacific. He had a clear sense of where his company's headed. Lance, welcome back to Mad Money. Jim, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to join you. All right, Lance, I am beginning to see green shoots. Our uh, auto reporter, Phil LeBeau, is saying that the numbers have finally turned up. They're not that much down from last year. That, I think, is very, very important. Housing numbers, because you move a lot of wood. Nine straight good weeks of mortgages. Are you seeing the green shoots that I am? Yeah, Jim, I am. But before I get to that answer, I also want to start with just a shout out to my employees and the excellent work they're doing, keeping themselves, each other, and their families and loved ones at home safe and healthy. So they're doing a tremendous job supporting the economy, as you point out. And I am seeing those green shoots. We're seeing it in the automotive industry, housing. We're also seeing it in grain through the U.S. or the uh, U.S. China Phase One deal. And I'm seeing it uh, a little bit in construction of things like road projects and rock. So, so across our markets, we're seeing a, a, a few signs of optimism. Now, is it possible, Lance, because you've become such a great operator, that even with a little bit of more business, that it could fall to the bottom line and make it so the comparisons won't be as tough? Yeah, Jim, there's no doubt that with our current operating ratio in, in the first quarter, we had the best margins in the industry. There's no doubt that incremental volume creates wonderful incremental margin. The other thing that operating ratio does for us is it, it fundamentally shifts the playing field. We can now compete for business that looks attractive to us at pricing that two years ago didn't look attractive. It's really opened up markets for us. Well, it, can it open up markets for things like e-commerce or is the stuff that e-commerce ships too small for you? Oh, shoot. Uh, our parcel business is up strong double digits right now. We are we are seeing the e-commerce demand flow through to our, our rail business. I did not know. It's for, fantastic. At the same time, we know the energy went down to minus 37. It's come back a little. You do have some energy exposure. Uh, you also have some coal exposure. How are those two cargos? Yeah, so coal is in long-term secular decline, right. and, and we continue to see that. Uh, if you compare it to the kind of coal volumes we shipped 15 years ago, we're down easily about two-thirds. Uh, it looks like it's going to be steady. It's going to grow or shrink with weather and with competing fuels and the impact on things like uh, natural gas pricing. But in the long, long run, I, I think that that's a piece of business that probably is in long-term secular decline. We do see in the energy world things like uh, wind turbines, uh, equipment being shipped. Uh, we see some LNG going in and out of storage, mm -hmm. LPG. Uh, we also see petroleum and petroleum products, refined products uh, that we ship. A lot of that's uh, being shipped into Mexico right now. But let's talk about this plastics business. Because you are, you are smack in the middle of it. The last time you were here, we talked about how good it, they're building so many plants. Now it's starting to come to fruition. Is America going to be the capital of this business in the way that China used to be? I'm telling you, it is. Uh, if you look globally, the United States is now tending to be the low-cost producer for plastics. There is an exception to that. Sometimes you'll go into the Middle East and you'll find facilities where natural gas as a feedstock is literally free. But if you set that aside, and even with that, the United States is exceptionally competitive globally. And it's producing more than the United States can consume. So it's also helping the trade balance. And we see that in a product, you know, as you know, we've got a wonderful Gulf Coast franchise 
and we're taking plastics from the Texas Gulf Coast and the Louisiana Gulf Coast, moving them up to Dallas to an intermodal facility where there's a lot of international intermodal boxes that are made empty, filling them with the plastics and then shipping them off the West Coast back to Asia for consumption. It's a wonderful model. Yeah, oh, that is very, very good. And not was well, not there five years ago. Now, how about uh, if we got an infrastructure bill, uh, the roads would be better, and that would uh, compete with you more. But you do have a great intermodal business. Isn't one of the great advantages of the rails that our roads are crumbling? Absolutely, you, you hit it right on the head. The the beautiful thing about railroads and taking trucks off the highway into our intermodal product is one, we are far more carbon efficient and fuel efficient, four or five times as much. And two, you don't have to rely on the Highway Trust Fund to fund railroads. We own our own railroad right of way, and we make those investments every year on our own cash flow. So it, it's free to the American public to bring it onto the railroad, and it's better for the environment. Now, the analysts aren't speaking at all about uh, about Mexico, which you guys really have a fabulous business. And we, you know, we're coming up with a new NAFTA deal, much better than the old one. What does it mean for Union Pacific? Yeah, USMCA goes into force on July 1st. And our perspective of the deal is that the U.S. Trade Rep's office and, and Bob Lighthizer specifically, with his counterparts in Canada and Mexico, have negotiated a much better an enhancement to the NAFTA deal. So for us, it means the linkage, the supply chain linkage between the U.S. economy, the Mexican economy, and the Canadian economy are going to continue to grow and become more and more powerful. And we as a trading block are going to be much more competitive globally. It's, it's just a home run. It's a big win for the U.S. economy. One last question. I know you had to, and I know this is not what you want to do. You had to, I'm going to say furlough, not close, three different facilities. When I listen to you, Lance, I think it could be month by month. That maybe, maybe we even see those places open by your end. Yeah, Jim. So the fact that volume's off so much for us uh, means there's less work in our front line, uh, whether you're running the trains, fixing the railroad, fixing the cars, or, or fixing the locomotives. So we've had those jobs because of the work de decrease. We've had to furlough employees out of those jobs. I will also tell you, Jim, that we, we've done a tremendous job of sharing the burden across all employees. Our management employees are, for the months of May, June, July, and August, uh, having to take one unpaid week leave of absence every month. Uh, and our executives and our board have taken a 25% pay cut. The whole idea wow. was to make sure we maintain the flexibility to have the workforce we need when the, when the economy comes back, but be prudent and react to being down 25% on volume. Well, Lance, thank you so much. It's great to hear some optimism, which is justified by facts, not by fiction. It's always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Jim. It's a real pleasure. Okay, that's Lance Fritz. He's Union Pacific Chairman, President, CEO. Ah, I wish my travel trust owned this stock. Well, there's always a chance. Stick with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.